Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dean of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering, Giannis Yortzos. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, and welcome to the 31st Annual Viterbi Awards. For obvious reasons, we did not mean to hold the event on April 1st. <laughs> but conflicting schedules did not cooperate. But good things happen on April 1st. For example, it is Rachmaninoff's birthday. It is also today the day that the university officially acquired two new hospitals. <laughs> Before we proceed with our program, allow me to take a moment to acknowledge some special friends of the Viterbi School. Please stand when I call your name and remain standing so we can recognize you as a group. Please hold your applause until I have called them all. We have with us tonight trustees Malcolm Curry, who also won the Management Award in 1984, and Daniel Epstein, Distinguished Alumnus Award of 1994 and board, member of the Board of Councillors of the School of Engineering, UC Trustees. <laughs> Our Provost, CL Max Nikias, and his wife, Nikki. <laughs> From our Board of Councillors, Gordon Anderson and his wife, Liz, who won the Distinguished Alumnus Award in 1998, Jim Baum and his wife Judy, John Deininger, Albert Dorman, Jay Keir, Brian Min, and Don Paul, BOC members of the Viterbi School. and Ron Barnes. Ron, I'm sorry, I forgot you, but you're here. <laughs> we have also some additional past awardees. James Keenan, Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2001, and Ken Richardson, Distinguished Alumnus Award 1997. Finally, we have our honorees tonight, Narayana Murthy, Don Paul, and Don, Tom Reed, and his wife, Kay. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Since its first incarnation in 1978, the Viterbi Awards has been a significant annual event for the school. It has become our forum for recognizing outstanding members of the engineering community and those of our own alumni who have made lasting contributions to engineering in all its manifestations. These manifestations are multiplying. Now engineers paint on a new canvas pictures never seen before. We call it Engineering Plus. This evolution appears practically in all our endeavors, most spectacularly in health, as in Engineering Plus Medicine. In fact, the Viterbi School and other engineering schools in the country are busy incorporating such insights into our curricula with more societal outreach more enabling of other disciplines, even higher aims. This powerful toolkit is needed to solve our current challenges. Of course, our honorees were already ahead of the curve in this endeavor decades ago. About this time last year, the National Academy of Engineering articulated 14 grand challenges for engineering. These were centered on important societal and human needs and were roughly categorized as follows. Sustainability, health, vulnerability, and the joy of living. 
a subject I should mention, where engineers have earned an unjustified reputation of not being very good at. <laughs> of course, this is not so at USC. Last month, along with Duke University and All in College, USC Engineering co-hosted the first ever NAE Grand Challenges Summit at the Duke campus. I had the privilege of making the summary closing address at the summit. I'll be, I began by borrowing NAE President Chuck Vest's spectacular description of the criteria for a modern engineer. The modern engineer, let's call it Engineer, engineer 2.0, is an engineer in the traditional sense, let's say Engineer 1.0, a leader, an innovator and an entrepreneur. Passion was also mentioned in the summit as a much desired characteristic. What a welcome addition to the engineering job description. Our honorees today exemplify these attributes and more over the span of their remarkable careers. Can Engineering Plus also help us get out of our current crisis? Our answer is an emphatic yes. In fact, one can map almost one-to-one -one the federal stimulus activities to the grand challenge themes of urban infrastructure, information technology and health, green technologies, K-12 through education. Sustainability, health, vulnerability, even the joy of living, so to speak, depend greatly on public policy which can be another venture of Engineering Plus, a theme that deals with human nature, brings about constantly changing complexity, and makes life interesting on its own. Our honorees have worked on such challenges for a long time now. Their work seems to have come in widely disparate fields on energy, vulnerability and prevention of nuclear terror, enabling for a better life. But a closer look reveals that each of them followed the same method. They applied engineering in government, policy, business, and the industry. And in so doing, they transformed national security. They transformed the oil industry. They helped transform an entire nation. It is a distinct pleasure for me to represent the Viterbi School in honoring these remarkable individuals. Thank you. The Mark A. Stevens Distinguished Alumnus Award is named for USC engineering alumnus and USC trustee Mark A. Stevens. Please direct your attention to the video screen to learn about the groundbreaking work of one of, one of our graduates who has made us proud. Few have greater insights into the end of the Cold War than Thomas Reed. As special assistant to President Reagan on national security policy, Tom was the author of National Security Decision Directive 32, which provided the roadmap for ending the long-standing tensions with the Soviet Union. Born in New York City during the Great Depression, Tom Reed seemed destined for a life of public service. His military career began at Cornell University's Air Force Reserve Officer Training Program. Graduating first in his class with a degree in engineering, Tom's first military assignment was serving as technical project officer for the first Minuteman reentry vehicle system. During his tenure in the Air Force's Ballistic Missile Division, Tom also earned his graduate degree from USC. Assigned to the famed Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in 1959, Tom designed two thermonuclear devices that were ultimately fired over the Pacific Ocean as a series of tests in 1962. He traded physics for politics when he became the Northern California chair of Ronald Reagan's first gubernatorial race. He served as then Governor Reagan's chief of personnel and went on to help Reagan win re-election in 1970 as his campaign director. Three years later, Tom was recruited by the Pentagon and served as Director of National Reconnaissance. He was appointed Secretary of the Air Force in 1976. 
Having served under Presidents Ford and Carter, Tom had the privilege of serving in Ronald Reagan's administration until 1983. He captured his eyewitness view of the last days of the Cold War in his first book, At the Abyss, an insider's history of the Cold War. This year, he released his second book, Nuclear Express, which offers a fascinating insider's perspective on nuclear proliferation in the past, where the world stands today, and where the future may take us. For his contributions to both science and his country, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering is pleased to present Thomas C. Reed with the Mark A. Stevens Distinguished Alumni Award. Tom, could you please join me up here? As a sidelight to this award, I should note that this is also the 50th anniversary of Tom's USC degree. <laughs> Tom, for your contributions to engineering, science, public policy, and public outreach, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering is pleased to present you with a Mark A. Stevens Distinguished Alumnus Award. Say a few words. Well, I really enjoyed that uh, video show, the very skinny guy. <laughs> what you see in the video may or may not be true, given this day of graphic uh, computer enhancement and so forth and so on, but it was, it was really nice to see. Uh, if all those things happen, it's, it is because of events that happened here, or more accurately, a little south of here on campus just 50 years ago. Just 50 years ago, it was my last year of graduate school. Uh, I was uh, enrolled in electrical engineering, uh, but I was fortunate that the engineering school allowed the graduate students to proceed into and study the basic scientists, sciences. I uh, took a course in electromagnetism, but the fundamental event was taking a course in nuclear physics, physics 460. It was taught by Professor Richard Scalater. Professor Scalater seemed like a uh, really esteemed member of the faculty. He made every lecture a wonderful detective story. Uh, he seemed like the grand old man of campus. Of course, I was 24. Uh, he was a creaky old uh, postdoc of 32. But at the time, he really seemed to be outstanding, as he was. His lectures, every lecture was a detective story. Uh, he led us through Michelson and Morley looking for signs of the ether. He let us practically, practically pet Schrodinger's cat. Uh, and he told us about people shooting electrons through slits to get very strange results. Professor Scalater fired my imagination about the nucleus, and it really changed my life. It equipped me uh, to get, you know, get a degree from the university. That, in turn, let me to fool a bunch of people at Livermore into hiring me into the weapons physics laboratory. Uh, and three years later, I was out in the Pacific watching my experiments light up the summer sky. It was a, a truly grand time. It was a graduation just 50 years ago. Uh, my daughter was here at the time. She was not quite born. She was eight and a half months along, but she was stood there at graduation time. And we've had a wonderful time since. And it's wonderful to have my kids here and to have all of you honor me. But the greatest honor goes to Professor, Professor Richard Scalati, Scalater, uh, who, who unfortunately died five years ago. I invited his son to be with us here because his son has carried on as a professor of physics at UC Davis. Uh, all these accolades that you've accorded to me uh, really belong to your dad, Richard. And when you say your prayers tonight, thank you for me. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Um, I should uh, mention that there is no moratorium on eating, so you can actually start eating your salads. Okay. <laughs> so. And now it's my pleasure to introduce a special award, one that is going to another very special individual. Please direct your attention to the video screen to learn about the contributions that have earned him our Distinguished Service Award. As the first Chief Technology Officer for the Chevron Corporation, Dr. Donald Paul has played an instrumental role in advancing how we leverage our energy resources. Today, Don continues to seek out new and innovative ways to meet the growing demand for sustainable energy. A native of Los Angeles, Don pursued his education at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1975, just a few years after the OPEC oil crisis signaled a possible worldwide energy shortage, Don returned to California to work as a research geophysicist with the Chevron Oil Field Research Company. Over the next three decades, he would help spearhead the company's efforts to find more effective ways to identify and produce oil and gas, as well as pursue the transformative potential of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. In 1990, Don was appointed Vice President for Exploration Research. Two years later, he was named President of Chevron Petroleum Technology Company, responsible for research, technology, and technical services in support of worldwide exploration and production operations. In the fall of 1996, Chevron appointed Don as Vice President of Technology and Environmental Affairs and its first Chief Technology Officer. In this position, Don bridged the worlds of technology and energy through groundbreaking partnerships. In 1999, Don met with then USC School of Engineering Dean Max Nikias. What emerged from their discussion was the beginning of a groundbreaking joint venture between USC and Chevron, the Center for Interactive Smart Oilfield Technologies. Says Don of the partnership, Chevron and the USC Viterbi School of Engineering have created a unique environment that combines the capabilities of faculty and students with the industry. Last year, Don retired from Chevron after an exceptional 33-year career. He continues to influence and inform the policies and practices related to energy as founder of Energy and Technology Strategies, LLC. He remains active in the Trojan family, serving as Executive Director of the USC Energy Institute and advisor to the USC Provost on matters related to energy and technology. For his contributions as a researcher, collaborator, leader, and forward-thinking strategist, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering is proud to bestow on Dr. Donald Paul its Distinguished Service Award. For your contribution to the Viterbi School as a visionary leader, supporter, and forward-thinking strategist, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering is proud to present you its Distinguished Service Award. Well, good evening, uh, everyone, and, and I just I want to start by saying how deeply honored I am to be in such distinguished company, not only with the other awardees, but also all, the, all of you are here uh, this evening. Um, you know, Anonymous saw those films before they came out, so I think that uh, we're always, uh, uh, it, it is interesting how to see uh, your life portrayed as others would portray it. But um, in the next few minutes, I, I just wanted to say that the path that leads people to this podium tonight, uh, for me, certainly wouldn't have been predicted. But specifically, the connection to USC, as some of you may know, for me, 
actually began when I didn't know anything about it, other than that I was being born when my father was taking a calculus exam in the School of Engineering here at USC. <laughs> it was a long time ago. But um, with respect to uh, uh, what's happened uh, with uh, USC and Chevron and my personal involvement with it, uh, I would like to thank a few people specifically. First and foremost, I would like to thank Provost Max Nikias. Uh, I remember... Uh, uh, frankly, I would say there is little doubt that I wouldn't be here, um, wouldn't be so honored, and uh, if it had not been for that late afternoon meeting that Max and I had in San Francisco. That was when Chevron's headquarters was still downtown. And it was a late uh, afternoon meeting. And um, it turned out to be a two or two and a half hour meeting. And the reason is, is because I had been nurturing a vision about how universities and companies could work together to combine technologies in ways that had not been combined before, but moreover to combine cultures and interactions of industry and universities in ways that perhaps had not been combined before. And amazing, amazingly enough to me, we started in that discussion and within 30 minutes, I think both of us knew that we had the same view of this. And I think that was a, that was a striking and critical uh, component that led to the Center for smart oil field technologies. Now, many really good ideas and visions don't ever materialize. And they don't materialize because most often the people who really do it and really can take those visions and turn them into reality, successful reality, are what's required. And, I, and in that regard, I want to thank uh, Professor Iraj Ishagi from the Viterbi School. And Mike Hauser from Chevron, together those two made this happen. Now, they obviously did not do it alone. And in that regard, uh, I can't name everyone, but I certainly want to thank all of my colleagues at USC that participated in this uh, success. But also, I would like to thank, uh, and I know there's some, some of them that, that, that made the trip here today, my colleagues from uh, Chevron who made this, this happen. Uh, I think that's been the key. Someone asked, uh, actually I was asked before uh, the dinner, why USC? And then of course one can go on with the technical strengths, they're vital. One can go on with the opportunities, that's vital. In the end, successful partnerships, I personally believe, depend upon a match between vision and culture and capability. All those things coming together and that's happened at USC. So how incredibly fortunate, I guess, I look at myself and, and where I've come, because after uh, uh, a wonderful experience at, at Chevron, here I am back in the fold uh, with USC. And I just want to mention for a moment the going forward. Uh, what, a, what an amazing time in energy, an amazing time in technology, and I want to thank uh, Provost Nikias and Vice Provost Randy Hall uh, for their support in what we're trying to do in the USC Energy Institute. I think it's a fantastic time. And uh, we, I believe we will deliver, as USC always has, to play a key role in one of the most important issues of our time, and that's providing clean, affordable energy. For the, that the world needs going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. Um, very soon you will be serving your dinner, but as, a, as an appetizer, <clears throat> I was, want to tell you something about April 1st. <clears throat> In 1998, Burger King ran an ad in USA Today saying that one could get a Whopper for left-handed people whose condiments were designed to drip out of the right side. <laughs> Not only did customers order the new burgers, but some specifically requested the old 
right-handed burgers. <laughs> so please enjoy your dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Giannis Yotsos. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoy your dinner. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I was reminded that in our audience today, there are 12 members of the National Academy of Engineering and at least three members of the National Academy of Sciences. So we can practically hold a regional meeting here. <laughs> the Daniel J. Epstein, Epstein Management Award is named after a distinguished leader in industry management, an outstanding USC engineering alumnus, the namesake of our industrial and systems engineering department, and a USC trustee, Daniel J. Epstein. Please direct your attention. Please direct your attention to the video screen to learn about the world-changing work of our honoree. Entrepreneur and IT icon Nariana Murthy knew the world was flat long before the notion became a world bestseller. As co-founder and former CEO of Infosys Technologies Limited, Nariana helped write a new chapter in the globalization of business. He envisioned and then implemented the global delivery model that put India on the map for providing IT services worldwide. The Infosys story began in 1981 when Narayana and six fellow software professionals invested $250 to launch a software company out of his Mumbai apartment. Over the next two decades, Infosys would become the first Indian company listed on the NASDAQ and grow to more than 100,000 employees worldwide with revenues of $4 billion. Behind this dramatic rise was the vision and entrepreneurial drive of Narayana. The son of a math teacher, Narayana earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Mysore and a graduate degree from the Indian Institute of Technology. After working abroad and experiencing capitalism firsthand, he launched Infosys at the age of 34. He would serve as the company's CEO for 21 years. During his tenure, the company set the standard for both innovation and ethics. In recognition of his groundbreaking work, Narayana has been awarded with countless honors worldwide. In 2004, Time Magazine identified him as one of the 10 global leaders helping to shape the future of technology. Two years later, Time voted him as one of the Asian heroes who have brought about revolutionary changes in the region in the last 60 years. He has been named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the World and was awarded the second highest civilian honor by the Indian government in 2008. The ultimate uh, contribution of emphasis is there are thousands and probably millions of entrepreneurs in the country who would say, look, if these seven jokers could do it together, we could do it too. I think that is the ultimate compliment. In 2008, Infosys and Viterbi announced a new partnership to create a software research and education center at USC. USC professor Victor Persana, co-director of the new center, says of Narayana, he is the most respected Indian entrepreneur in the world. For his contributions in changing the face of global business and for his continuing work as a mentor, ambassador and visionary, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering is pleased to present Narayana Morthy with the Daniel J. Epstein Management Award. Narayana, for your contributions in changing the face of global business, for your paving of the flood world, and for your continuing work as a visionary leader, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering is pleased to present you 
with the Daniel J. Epstein Management Award. Provost uh, Max Nikias, Dean uh, Yartos, Daniel Epstein, fellow awardees, friends. I am extremely grateful to the kindness, generosity, and affection of the University of Southern California for this honor. Emphasis was founded on three fundamental principles. First, globalization. I define globalization as the paradigm by which you source capital from where it is cheapest, you source talent from where it is best available, you produce where it is most cost effective, and sell where the markets are without being constrained by national boundaries. The second principle on which emphasis was founded is collaborative distributed development model, which is a model that helps talent in geographically distributed locations to come together using technology, systems, and processes to compress time cycle and to enhance productivity and quality. And of course, the third concept is the 24-hour workday, which helps combine the prime time of this country, certainly this, this city, with the city of Bangalore, my hometown, whereby we will get 24 hours of productive time using the staff here and the staff in Bangalore. The company has been founded to be a globally respected corporation. Our motto is very well communicated by our belief that the softest pillow is a clear conscience. Our focus on customers is buttressed by our belief that you look good in front of your customers if your customer looks good in front of his or her customers. Our belief in creating an open, meritocratic, and pluralistic environment for our employees is based on our belief or our adage in God we trust, everybody else brings data to the table. <laughs> Our belief in transparency and corporate governance is communicated pretty well by our adage, when in doubt, disclose. Well, let me once again thank you people for your kindness and your generosity. Your kindness, your generosity, and your, your affection will definitely make me work harder and hopefully smarter. Thank you. What a great lesson in global business. I learned something. We wanted to do something unique for our special evening, so I am pleased to offer a delightful closing to this event. Rachel Lauren is a music industry and judge major on scholarship at the USC Thornton School of Music. There, she finds the time to self-manage her career as a performer, run her own record company, volunteer weekly at local elementary schools, and stay on the honor roll. She's an accomplished singer who has been performing publicly since her early childhood. Since her discovery of jazz at the age of 15, 
she has become an emerging star by applying her own innovative style to classic jazz standards. Please welcome USC's own Rachel Lauren. Introduction. What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in. Well, it's almost like being in love. There's a smile on my face for the whole human race. Well, it's almost like being in love. All the music of life seems to be like a bell that is ringing for me and from the way that i feel when that bell starts to peel well it's almost like being almost like being it's almost like being in love That's Gary Matsumoto on piano. What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in. Well, it's almost like being in love. There's a smile on my face for the whole human race. Well, it's almost like being in love. All the music of life seems to be like a bell that is ringing for me. And from the way that I feel when that bell starts to peel, well, it's almost like being, almost like being, it's almost like being in love. Almost like being in love. Thank you. Once again, that's Gary Matsumoto on piano. And I don't know if he mentioned, but I'm graduating in a couple of weeks. And <laughs> with this economy, this next song holds a special place in my heart. When all the world is a hopeless jumble and the raindrops tumble to the ground, heaven opens a magic lane. When all the clouds darken up the skyway, there's a rainbow highway to be found, leading from your window pane.
to a place beyond the sun Just a step behind the rain Somewhere over the rainbow Way up high There's a land that I heard of Once in a lullaby Somewhere over the rainbow Skies are blue And those dreams that you dare, dare to dream Really do come true Someday I wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Oh, where troubles melt like lemon drops away oh, above the chimney tops. That's where you will. Somewhere over the rainbow, blue bluebirds fly, birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh, why can't I? Someday I wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Oh, where troubles melt like lemon drops, oh, way above the chimney tops, that's where, where you will find me. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh, why can't I? If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow. Why, oh, why can't 
Thank you, Rachel. I think Rachel has helped us solve the grand challenge of the NAE on the joy of living. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with this, we bring the Viterbi Award to a close. I want to thank all of our award winners again, Tom, Don, Narayana, and all of you for coming and joining us tonight. We hope to see you again soon. Good night.